And welcome to another edition of the Nerdy Agent Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Pedersen, with my one brother and fellow nerd today, Josh. AJ is down in Miami watching the 4-0 and Future World Series champions, Let's Minnesota go twins. twins. Josh just set the parade for November 2nd. It's going to be really cold, and we will be there. Why is AJ not on like Zoom or something, like zooming in from Florida that at, the, at the ocean? Just yeah, on that would have been fun. I've actually seen some, some podcasts are doing that, where you have one person, if they're out of town on Zoom. Um, my favorite podcast, Talking Baseball, they did that even when one of them was at their wedding. They were It was like the day before when the dude was on Zoom before. That's awesome. Which is pretty awesome. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the inventory crisis in Minnesota and the nation, kind of how we got to where we are right now and where we think that we'll go uh, from here. But to start, the Would You Rather of the Week brought to you by ChatGPT. If you haven't heard of ChatGPT, you mean? I made up this question under a rock. About. I made this up with my own mind. <laughs> you highlighted the wrong the wrong line. For the question that he, <laughs> there we go. Would you rather live in a tiny house with no mortgage or a mansion with a thirty-year mortgage? My first question is: so many questions. What are they worth? Caveat matters so much. Are they worth the same amount of money? I think that would be the best way to do that. Yeah, the tiny house has no mortgage; it's worth fifty grand, and the mansion is worth four million and <laughs> has a five thousand dollars mortgage on it yeah. for the next thirty years. No, no, no I'm so. saying, I'm saying, tiny house, tiny house for sure. Really? I because actually Because if you have no mortgage, you have no payments, so you can use all that money to add on to your tiny house and make it a big house. Yes. And now she has a now she has Haley a Haley wants to knock down the tiny house. It's on a huge <laughs> And then Haley's gonna refinance into a thirty year mortgage with her mansion is what's going yes. on in that situation. So I I would say it's kind of a question of like, would you rather not because we see this a lot with buyers where I have conversations with them, they're like, We want to spend one point two million and you're like do you really want to, just because you can, doesn't mean you necessarily should, right? So I've always been more in the camp of, I'd rather have a smaller mortgage payment each month, if not no mortgage payment each month, and live in a house that I'm comfortable in versus one that has every potential bell and whistle that I could ever imagine and have to deal with feeling like I have a massive mortgage payment each month. So personally, while the question has a lot of open-endedness to it, I would pick the no mortgage over the 30-year mortgage and not live in the perfect house. I'd rather just live in one that I'm comfortable in. Yeah, I I would say it would depend on the payment for sure. If I was comfortable with the payment on the mansion, I'd probably prefer more space than a tiny house because tiny houses are really small. However, I am but now like how saying, tiny is a tiny house? Is and it? how big is a mansion? Because yeah. I don't want five thousand square feet. I don't even know how I could live in it. It'd be awful. We have a fifteen hundred square foot house right now, and I don't ever go in the basement. So I don't know how that would work. Um, however, a tiny house guys are, they're really small. Like I have someone buying a 700 square foot house right now and it's really small. Yeah. It's an apartment. It might be a little bit difficult. Yeah. Um, so we have two tiny houses and one mansion. I mean, I couldn't probably live in 700 square feet with my two children and my wife. There you go. So So that's an issue. Yeah. So now, now so I'll do what I do already. And I would buy a smaller house (laughs) than a mansion (laughs) and live in a more comfortable mortgage. That's not what chat GPT. (laughs) Um, let's get into the inventory crisis this week. So just to start, um, tell the listeners what we mean by inventory crisis, kind of what's happening within the marketplace. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's a lot of headlines about housing supply and it being at just really low points. Um, we've been talking about this for a number of years because it's continued to just kind of come down. So what's crazy to look at, especially in our local markets, I can, I can put those stats out there, but also just looking at kind of the national market. Um, if you go back to 2006 to 2008, and I tell every buyer this when I'm at my buyer consults, we had 30 to 40,000 homes on the market in Minnesota during that time frame. On average, that was about what we have. We are under 6,000 homes now. So if you think about that, we have lost 80 plus percent of our inventory. It just disappeared. And it's not just going to come back overnight. So as we think about rising prices and where they've gone, everyone's always been like, how do prices keep going up so drastically? And the answer to that is, if you've ever taken a basic economics class and that might micro 101, there's supply and there's demand. Those two things combined meet at a point in intersection that creates the price. So if there's not any supply, but there is still plenty of demand, the prices will keep going up until they meet that point where it's just unaffordable. The prices of widgets are going to continue to. Yeah, but even real estate will still, right? Like it's just, it, it'll so still continue to work the same way. They call them widgets. Widgets, yes. Um, but so like right now we have under 6,000 in Minnesota, but if you go back to even 2019, that number was over 12,000. So pre COVID we had twice as much inventory as we have right now. Nationally, it's playing about the same way where there were about 1.2 million homes for sale in 2019. That number is down to about 550,000 nationally right now. So 
a lot of things have happened and we'll kind of talk about maybe what has happened to create this. Um, and obviously interest rates being high right now has created an affordability challenge. Um, but like I mentioned, just the lack of inventory out there has kept markets competitive, have kept prices high. And, you know, what we'll talk about is where we think this is going to go in the future, yep. where we think things are going in the future will matter a lot to you because that's what's going to impact whether or not prices will stay where they are or go down. And I want to start by talking about how this happened. And you kind of touched on it a little bit, the, the cr- housing crisis, the recession in 2008. Yep. Um, do you want me to get into the details here? Because You're, I'm not we don't just have AJ the today. Yeah, we, we you, you go get it. So here, so I can keep what, talking too. Yeah, but. So here's what happened. So 2006 happened. We The bubble essentially popped and we lost an extraordinary amount of buyers in the market because yep. they no longer could qualify because they didn't have a job. And because mortgages were significantly harder to get at that time. Well, Dodd-Frank changed all the lending standards. And so that increased the number of things you had to do to qualify for a mortgage. But they also weren't giving out the low down payment mortgages, like even 5%. It was you had to have cash to buy these. Um, And at the same time, a bunch of people foreclosed on their property. So these properties were entering into the market. What happened at that time is, as most people know, prices came down a lot. Yep. And people lost a lot of money. Now, there's two ways to go about this. I know we, we I'm going to have you touch on builders, but the yep. first thing that I want to touch on was when prices came down a lot and the people that still had money saw these prices and they went, oh man, I can, I can mop up right now and yep. I can buy a bunch of property. I can turn these into rentals um, and I can do really well. And so you saw, especially I would say from a national landscape, again, we're in the Twin Cities area. We're not experts on different states. In Minneapolis specifically, a bunch of investors cleaned up, made their career in the crisis and they bought a bunch of properties. And that was the, that was the initial, I would say outside of builders, which you'll touch on, that was the initial kind of pulling back of inventory in the Twin Cities market was all these investors buying these properties. And they hadn't really, I mean, up until like 2018, 2019, they hadn't really sold them. I think that there's been maybe a little bit more of that, but Mm -hmm. they're they're really just not putting them on the market. They're just holding the properties now. Right. Yeah. And then the other thing we talk about, and as we've talked about supply and demand, the important thing to think about with supply and demand is it's about like net supply increases. So people are always like, well, if listings just go up and people sell their houses, this will get better. It's like, well, no, it won't because unless those people sell that house and either move to another market, die, move into a renter position or buy a new construction house, there's still a net zero when it comes to the supply problem. So because they add one supply, but then they also add one demand because they're also buying a house. Exactly. They're not, they're not exiting on an off ramp and just getting out of the market. They're selling a house and they're buying a house. So they're just kind of like exiting and then they're getting right back on the freeway. So you're still going to have a lot of congestion there. Um, the other big thing with that is to help people get into new construction houses that creates net plus one, right? So you sell a house to a new buyer, you buy a newly created house. We have a, a fix for the problem, right? We're creating more supply in that sense. Um, but the builders have gone through a lot in the last 20 years, right? So think about 2008, market went really south. A lot of people lost everything on that were builders that had invested in that time frame because things have been going up, 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 up. Builders have been buying up land, they're investing, they're doing all these things, and then the market goes to nothing. And well, they were building rapidly too. And they lost everything. And so coming out of that, the builders have been far more conservative since 2008 in their ramp up period back up to some sort of normalcy. They started to ramp up faster into 2020 and the builders were looking really good in 2020 and then COVID happened and then that created an immediate panic of, oh gosh, this is going to happen again. The market's going bad. The market's going bad. Let's slow down building. And then the supply chain stuff on top of that during COVID was an absolute nightmare. So build times got postponed, pushed out, costs started going way up. So if you remember back to like lumber doubling and tripling, so builders were really nervous because you can't. If you're trying to price out a house in six to eight months, but lumber is doubling, how do you truly price that out properly and end up making any money on the back end when you don't know where supplies are going to go and when they're going to get there and how long it's going to take? And then all of the, you know, impact to the construction crews too. There was just, it was a huge mess that created even more of a dip on the supply side. Now coming out of that, they started ramping up again and then the market kind of turned south in November, December this year and interest rates have gone way up through the roof again. And so builders are once again nervous. So if you're not creating new supply because there's no stability in your market, you're going to continue to have this problem with supply in general. And the builders today are significantly less likely 
to ever ramp up, and we'll talk about the future, but ramp up fast enough to catch up to the current demand because they're always a so little significant. Well, and they're always a little bit concerned like, hey, well, you know, we're doing pretty well. I'm not going to leverage myself too far just in case. Yep. Even if there's nothing that shows that anything's going to happen, they're still kind of like, yeah, I'm going to be a little careful. And then the second something happens, rates go to seven. You have you heard, I mean, when that happened, you did hear some of these bigger national builders pulling out of billion dollar land yep. contracts because they just didn't even want to risk it. Um when they actually probably would have ended up making a decent amount of money this year. They've done they, really well. They went with those contracts, but they would rather be afloat and still building houses than even take that risk. Um, well, and remember when we did the we did the builder index yes, I wonder as a podcast, right that was like three months ago. Um, but at that point in time, the builder index had gone from like an 85, which was like a historic high, to I want to say like a 48 in a span of like two months. This was like back in November, December. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the builders basically went from like, things are great, things are awesome, to, oh my gosh, this is the worst it's ever been. The market's falling apart. They were selling off all the, we, we cleaned up at that time. We had new buyers buy new construction. They were selling off all their spec homes that they'd already built. And they were giving awesome interest rate Incredible deals. Incredible incentives, just mm-hmm. trying to get rid of them. And so if you had a buyer in November, December, you were, we had a, I had a lot of, we had a lot of success just buying built up homes from some of the national builders. But now it's not the same anymore. So I've had I've had like a couple of clients where like we get a free basement, even on a new build that they hadn't even negotiated. Yeah. Now you can't get any of that stuff because the market's looking good again. But to Luke's point, they're not going to just ramp up rapidly now because there's still so much uncertainty and there's still so much that's bit them in the past. And they would probably rather, I don't want to speak for them, they'd probably rather build houses in a inventory crisis market. Yeah, it's they don't favorable want, for they, pricing. And they know, like I imagine they know in the Twin Cities area, how many houses Lennar and DR build in one year, how much that adds and increases inventory versus not. I'm sure. And I'm sure they know what they have to build that isn't too much. I have a fun, I, I'm looking up the Builder Confidence Index because I'm curious what it is right now. Yeah. Um, can you guess what it was on January 31st of 2009? 2009? Yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, no, not good. Eight. I was gonna say like forty, but eight, eight, eight. Yeah, so that's that's the lowest it's ever been, and then and then we hit. So we got up to this is an index of one to a hundred. So imagine if everyone said like, "How are you feeling?" One to a hundred, and you're like, "I feel an eight today." Uh, not good. Not good. I feel like I'm no longer going to build houses. Yes. Um, right before, so it's like what the Mar- Timberwolves felt after that loss to the Blazers. <laughs> yeah. March first, twenty twenty, seventy two. April first, twenty twenty, thirty eight, thirty. Yeah. One month. COVID then, freaked everybody out. And then by October of 2020, we were back to 85. Yep. And then we fell off a cliff on, November 2022. Yeah, it was. Well, we got on December 1st, 2022, we got to 31. Yep. And then... Now it's probably back have, up again to 60, yeah, 70. doesn't have the new, the new year. So I'd have to find that somewhere else. Um, It'd be interesting to know if we're back up in the 60s. I bet we'd probably be in around the 70 point right now. Yeah, I'd have to find that. Um, I, I, that's my guess as well, but the builders do play a big, a big role in, um, what that's going to look like moving forward. Um, the other, other major there problem, is one other, there is one other piece. Here so the there. interest rate component, right? Mm-hmm. The, 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 the disparity between interest rates is one of the largest reasons why we have a problem right now. So I tell a lot of my buyers when I'm meeting them for the first time, this is something you should steal and take because depending upon who you're talking to, your conversation at buying call and settle about how the market is, is really important. If you're talking to someone buying in the first time home buyer price range, wherever that is for your market, but I tell people in ours, it's like 300 to 400,000, um, you're still going to be up against a lot of competition because the buyer pool that you're up against is people that are choosing between buying a house for the first time or renting. Rent has risen rapidly. And so even with rates at six and a half percent, you're probably still looking at your options going like, I might be better off buying. So I'm going to get in the market. So we have a lot of buyers. So a lot of demand for that range of price but we have very low supply. And the reason we have very low supply is because the people who own those houses in the 300, 400,000 range, they can choose to do a couple different things if they want to move. They can either stay, right? Because their alternative if they sell that house is to take an interest rate that's sub four right now in almost every case and go to six and a half. So you move from three to 400,000 to four to 600,000, somewhere in there, maybe even higher. And your payment just goes crazy. It's a drastic increase. Right? And we've had a number of buyers that fit that like move up category, right? 
and most of them have been really slow and tentative. I've had some that I've been working for like a year and a half. And there's like with interest rates, like I had one guy tell me, he's like, my payment on my house is $800 a month. The change in payment to go to a, like a seven, eight hundred thousand dollar house, like what we're looking at, three grand. He's like, it's a vacation every month. Yeah. Every single month, I could go on vacation if I just choose to live in this house. And I was yeah. like, it's a fair point, right? And so they're not selling those houses; they're just sticking around. So you have a lot of buyers trying to get into that range, but you have a, no one trying to sell those houses. The other thing that's happening is if you want to move out of that house, that eight hundred dollar a month mortgage. You can buy your seven eight hundred thousand dollar house, but instead of selling the other house, you just keep it and rent it because your mortgage is eight hundred dollars a month, and rents have gone up rapidly because and you interest can has gone offset up rapidly. some of the cost of what your mortgage payment is going to be on the seven eight hundred thousand exactly house. Yep. Rented for twenty five hundred, you're making seventeen hundred dollars a month. That you can then throw at your new mortgage payment. You can survive that way. So there's a lot of reasons why people aren't selling these starter homes, but why buyers are still invested. So if you're talking to clients in that range, I always make sure they know market's still competitive, even though rates are high. If you're talking to clients in the 550 and above in our markets, like 500 and above is the move up range, that market's less competitive because of the scenario I just described. The people are not moving into that range because they don't want to give up their interest rate at the lower side. So these interest rate, the interest rate disparity, that's the one where I would just call it, is like the big the gap between where people's rates are locked in and where they'd have to go to is the other major, major component driving this inventory crisis. And so moving away from kind of what, what caused the inventory crisis, where do we think this will go from here? Like in 10 years, which is hard. I know we don't have a crystal ball. I don't even know what's going in one year. Yeah. I'll, well, I can tell you in one year, we're going to be about the same months. It's not. Yeah. So like we're losing, I mean, we're looking at listings every week and new listings in our market are down what? 30% right now. 30 to 40%. Save them to 30 to 40. Same week last year. And last year was bad. It's like we keep losing 20 to 30% every year compared to the prior year. Yeah. And it's just bad. Our inventory levels are about the same as they were before, but that's because we're losing a lot of new homes. So the stuff that's just sitting out there is the bad options that no one wants. And we have, I mean, we have lost buyers because the, the sales in the Twin Cities market are going to be down. Pendings are down about 30%. 30% as well. So we, we're kind of in the same market with 30% less sales. So... There are yes. less buyers as well. Or you could just say that houses. because the houses that are available are so bad, the buyers that are out there are just like, just I'll pass. Yeah. You know, like there's just nothing for them. So um, I do not have an optimistic outlook on inventory in the short term and really even in the long term. I think builders are going to continue to be conservative because they've been burned too hard in the last 15, 20 years. There's some money to be made on their front by continuing to operate, but I think they're going to ramp production up slowly. I don't think you're ever getting back to the pre-2008 levels of building. And then on top of that, I think there's still going to be a number of people specifically in the, what is it? What gen are we talking about? That's buying into houses right now. Is it Z? Millennials. And Millennials. Z. Yeah, yeah. The first time home buyers. Yeah. I don't think they're going anywhere. I think a lot of people still want to what own gen, a house. What generation is that Haley? Do you know? Gen double A. No is that the she new one? Know. Gen double A. I don't know. Um, I Haley, we got Z, Z after in Excel, right? It goes Z then double A. Yeah, yeah, the next. Right. <laughs> um, I just think there's a lot of people still opting into buying. I think people that own real estate are going to keep owning. I think the disparity in real in, in interest rates, because I think interest rates will come down, but I don't think they're going to come down far enough where you're going to suddenly be like, well, I'm at three and now five and a half seems fine. Is going to continue to increase the rental market. I think the issue that we're going to run into, especially in the next 10 years, which I don't think that we fully realized in the twin cities market right now are if rates do get to five and a half how um how much a current homeowner feels good about getting a second mortgage and doing an addition onto their house something i'm considering right now exactly so i think i do think in the next 10 years we're going to see more additions than we've ever almost seen in this area in yep. my opinion because they will say well i'll just keep the three percent i'll get a second at five and a half and the payment's about the same i do like the area i can live in the house you know i, I it makes sense to me um and so i think that's going to be interesting to see where that goes but i agree with you in the next 10 years i mean and, we, and AJ's not here. He would have loved this conversation, I think. Yeah. But uh, we talk a lot about it. He's everything. also considering addition to his house. Exactly. And we are too. Yeah. And so if, the thought is we might be in an inventory crisis for the next decade. I don't see. I don't see a way out at the I don't moment. see a way out right now either. That's the problem. And so the only like idea is I've been like, what could get us out yeah, of this? How do we get out of it? That's the question. So one random idea. And this is, I'm spitballing this. I have no idea how to do this. But if there was any sort of way to create interest rate parity, so like, can, can you buy back the interest rate as a lender and then lock it in for a period of time? So basically I write you a check for 10 grand and then your interest rate goes up by a point 
or something like that, where we can try to find a way to get people back to a normal gap between interest rates on the market and off the market. Interesting. But you'd have to stay in the house for a certain period of time to get that money back. There'd have to be certain ways to do it. But if people could tap into the equity in their interest rate instead of the equity in their house, yeah, there would be a way for us to potentially create some more parity there. I mean, it's just, I don't, I don't know how you do it, but that was the thought is you have to create some way but to give people an incentive to move off the rate. Well, the other, the other thing that I had heard from somebody as far as like the lender in that situation is a lender, let's say, and I, again, they're probably not ever going to do this, but giving a homeowner some sort of um, incentive to sell their house, buy a new house and give them almost the same rate that they had versus what the market rate was. So like keep your, you're like using your mortgage again on the next house hmm. and maybe raise it a little bit. You can bit. kind of do the same thing then do it that way. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, the question becomes buy out your rate to get you to move so you could buy into a new mortgage rate, something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I do think that there might be, I do think there's possibly some opportunity on the lending side of things to be creative as far as that goes, but there's a lot of selling of the loans on the secondary markets and the yep. margins. If you, if you give someone another three and a half and then you try and sell it, your margins are going to get smashed when the prevailing rate is five and a half. So you're going to just lose money anyways, is my guess. Yeah. Unless you're holding that. Yep. But if, a, if, if, if random, but the whole point is to make them sell, right? So if they're holding it, then then. But if random CMG, let's just say, who is typically a one of the more they hold these loans, yep. says, "Hey, if you have a three and a half percent rate and you sell your place and you stick keep it with us, yep, you know, we'll change it to a four percent rate on the new house, and then there's they get the closing costs and kind of all that something stuff as figured well. out, and they were going to hold that loan anyways. So they do better they because they moved to four. I don't know. I, there, is there something that they can do that? I don't yeah. know. I don't know enough about the lending landscape. From we a, should have a conversation with our lenders and then come back with a crazy lending idea. It'd be cool. I, I do think that there might be some opportunity for that as well. Yep. Um, the other that's, thing I had was, random. The other thing I had was like governments getting involved, right? Yeah. So you're already seeing this in Minnesota where they're trying to limit the amount of single family investment properties people can hold. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they'll have success doing it, but if there's any way they can kind of try to create rules that don't allow the current problems to continue to perpetuate on the government side. Um, that'd be the way you could kind of figure out how to create more housing supply, right? So, you know, we own single family rentals in doing so essentially we're hurting the supply in those markets because we are holding more than one house and more than one, you know, people want to get into those markets. Maple Grove uh, recently said that they are not going to issue any new rental licenses. I think that's up this June or July for oh, review. Very, the thing is, though, all that. these cities, though, what they're saying is they basically don't want BlackRock coming in and just buying up 40 houses. That's what they're concerned about. They're not concerned about me and Luke buying three. No. Um, but if there's enough me and Luke's buying three, it still perpetuates a problem. It can. I mean, we have a... Co- and BlackRock I, doesn't really want to buy a bunch of Minnesota real estate, let's uh, be honest. We, there is a company... There is that one company in North... We should actually... Um, that'd be a good podcast to go over that article. There's a company in North Minneapolis that bought a bunch of properties did a horrible job managing them and then yeah. find a bunch of money. And yeah, that happens with so, investments. And that's bad. Um, but we do have like someone on our team as a past client who lives in Maple Grove and they were going to, they were going to live there for like a year or two and then move out and rent it, but they can't because they don't have the license. So I had a client, I sold this house because he wanted to move it into a rental. I was like, dude, you can't do that. Like they won't let you. And that, but that helps you that, to sell it. That does help the inventory situation, I suppose. Yeah. Um, to an extent. I also think from a government perspective, I don't know if you had this on your mind, but I do in the past, they have done in demand crisis situations. They've incentivized buyers to purchase houses. Yeah. Could incentivize sellers to sell houses. I think is an option. I know they're already making. How do you do it though? Give a seller ten, 10 grand, grand to sell your house. They did that with buyers in the. I, I got the recession. my first my first house. I got that exactly eight grand from whatever it was. Two thousand eight Obama, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Thing. Yeah, because they were trying to stimulate demand. Yeah, it worked for me. I took oh. the money and ran. Exactly. Script of the week. Script of the week. Let's talk about. I'll throw this at you. So, um, I'm just gonna say you're with a client and they're just a little bit confused. They're they're saying you know. Why, why is it so competitive? Why are there no houses on the market when all the headlines are telling me, you know, this is supposed to be inventory is supposed to be increasing because rates are super high. Um, and yet every house I see is in multiple offers. That's a good question. I kind of already answered it, didn't I? Well, that's what the script of the week is. It's just summarizing everything. Yeah. Well, I'd say well, Josh's first script of the week, by the way, uh, I've done one before. Well, right? not many. It usually gets them. So yeah, because I had that conversation. I had I had two buyer consults with new buyers in the same range, three hundred, four hundred thousand, on Saturday actually, and so I had this conversation with both of them. So 
I would say in depends on the range that you're in, right? So, but at the price range you're shopping at, assuming you're a first time home buyer, um, a lot of what's happened in the last few years has created a number of demand, but quite a bit of demand still in the marketplace for people that are like you buying your first house. Because if you think about your alternatives, you could either be renting or you could choose to be buying. Renting has gotten very, very expensive. So buying still looks like a pretty good option, even though interest rates are really high right now. So there's a lot of people like you still looking for their first property that look at buying as an advantageous situation opportunity. The problem we have is on the supply side right now. So if you think about it, the people that you'd be buying from that are selling these houses have an interest rate at sub 4% because that's where rates were back pre-COVID and during COVID. And so their options are either to sell at that 4% or below rate and then move up to a 6.5% rate, um, stay in that house, or choose to just rent that house out and then buy their next house. And so because of where the rate disparity is at the moment, there's not a lot of incentives for them to go anywhere. And if they do go anywhere, the incentives are set up so that they would rent versus buy. So we're not seeing a lot of people just selling their properties. We're seeing a lot of people hold on to them. So like yourself, there's a lot of people that want to buy, but unlike you, there's a lot of people that are holding these properties that don't want to sell. And so when you have a supply and demand imbalance like that, it does create rising pricing pressure. It does create competition in offers and multiple offer situations and, and all that stuff. So it's unfortunate because you'd think that rising rates would help create more, not affordability, but pricing pressure, negative downward pricing pressure. And we're seeing it to an extent, but it's not happening in the I same would way. actually argue that the rising rates almost hurt buyers more than it would have helped them if they stayed at like four and a half because you oh, it's hurting them for sure way more. Yeah. Well, but a lot of people said, oh, rates are going up. This is gonna be good for buyers. It they was did. good. It was good at first because people freaked out and didn't buy and you could get deals. That's fair. But now it's killing them. It's killing them. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's the script of the week. And that's all we have this week on the Nerdy Agent Podcast minus Nerd AJ. As always, remember, be better. Bye.